Good morning everyone. It is a great day to row and of course today is real special because this is the 49th year that I'm here on this earth and hopefully for 99.9% .9 of the time I would like to believe that I was a positive influence on around my world and environment. So I will try and be 100% from now on until another 251 years because after all we want to row until we are 300 years young let's go and row at arms only sitting up nice and tall chest out extend those arms flex the toes back belly button to the spine the shoulders are real low and we extend the arms completely so there's no half extension. We want to really extend those arms and feel really good. Sitting up tall, chest out. The hands are held in our fingertips. The palm of your hands have absolutely nothing to do with the handle itself. So we hold them in the fingertips. Of course, if you want to strengthen your grip, you can fist the handle as hard as you can for certain strokes, but then of course start relaxing in again, because after all, we don't want any crazy tennis elbow situation. Let's add in the swing off the upper body into one, and here we go. Swinging forward, sitting tall. Yep, the handle travels to the sternum, right below the chest line. And when you watch my wrists, my wrists are flush with the forearms. None of this, guys, right? None of the squirrel eating the acorn or the begging dog. But if it doesn't hurt you, this too is an exercise. But if we just focus on having the longest, most efficient, steady strokes, that are closest to the super efficiency of wanting to be the fastest rower in the world, well, then you keep your wrists flat to the forearms. Hinging forward, let those arms travel away from the body before the rise of the knees. And trust me, I have a few stories to tell you. As soon as you go to the full slide stroke, I will tell you a couple things about memorable things that I thought would be fun to share. Let's go to quarter slide rowing in one. On this one, quarter slide rowing. And look, I'm gonna slow it down just a little bit because it's the pick drill. We wanna make sure that when you bring the knees up, you bring them up once you have found your forward body angle. Right? So if you look at your handle, you kind of see how the handle goes right to the tip of your toes before the rise of the knees. Okay? That's right. And then let's go to half slide on this one. Here we go. Let's bring the knees up to half slide. Half slide. Half slide is where the knees meet the elbows. So where the knees meet the elbows, that's half slide. But also, okay. The knees stay down and you get that forward body angle. Definitely one of the more mechanical things in the rowing stroke. And I never get tired of saying that. Why? Because I remember that was really awkward. And I'll tell you when that was really awkward. The first day of it being really awkward. Let's go to three quarter slide in one. On this one, three quarter slide. Let's compress the legs, but don't lift the heels. We roll in, don't lift the heels. And as we roll in and we don't lift the heels, we make sure that the handle is as far away from you as possible. Very, very far away before the rise of the knees. Okay? That handle goes far away before the rise of the knees. And far away means that the elbows are completely extended. <laughs> and yesterday, I mentioned to one of the rowers that I'm coaching is, hey, why don't you point your finger, 
your arm fully straight. And then you know what that means to have a straight arm going forward. And let's move on to full slide into, <laughs> in one on this one. Now we roll onto the ball of the foot, extend those arms, easy does it. The shoulders, the shoulders, they just hang off your neck. <laughs> Don't carry your shoulders high. Show me your neck. Let the turtle stick its neck out. We being the turtle and the shoulders being the shell. I know you knew what I meant, but I thought it was good to describe. All right, here we go. Extending those arms, stretching it out. We'll do one more set of technical drills here. Left hand on your left knee, right hand on the handle only. Allow yourself to rotate and do it nice and smoothly. This is one of my favorite exercises to remind myself that there is no need to engage the upper body when you drive the legs until you have to. All right. And then let's go to change over the arm, right hand on our right knee, left hand on the handle and just really enjoy that. That's it. Very good. Extending the arm, pushing through. Somebody is not using their bicycle today. <laughs> and push and drive and extend forward. Both hands on. And you will just cruise along here. So, today we're cruising and we're going to just focus on our length, body prep, and pushing through. That's right. So, my first person that I ever coached was my own mom. That was when she turned 50, okay? That's a year from now for me. At age 50, my mom wanted to try and do the world championship on the rowing machine. And that's on the metal machine, the concept two machine. And I said, okay, mom, I'm going to send you a training program. I was 19 years old and I'd already gone to two junior world championship and a elite world championship. My mom, bless her heart, she ended up winning her, her, her age division after about seven months of training. So somewhere it's in the genes. And so what you learn from me on a weekly basis or daily basis when you watch the workouts is what I was taught and I was teaching technically to my mom is a very, very efficient, minimalistic stroke where we drive the legs and we don't engage the upper body. Hanging off the fingertips, letting the brunt of the stroke be built through the legs and then pulling that handle to the body. That's it. Driving it through and extending. And if you wonder what my paddle speed is here, so we had stroke rate 22. I've got a 159 moving along here. Extend those arms and pushing the body forward. Now, the reason I came to the United States is because my dad worked for a US company and it was founded here in Orange County, which is coincidental that I showed up here 
and made my home here. But so, him speaking English was very common, and I thought, all right, speaking English, my parents said, hey, you need to learn how to speak English. And so, with rowing, I was thinking, now I'm going to go row in the United States. And I was recruited to come over. The story, though, is that as a junior, at the Junior World Championship, I was riding the shuttle from the race course back to the hotel. And I chatted with the coxswain of the men's junior eight. I thought it was amazing to have eight people rowing a boat, perfectly synchronized, kind of militaristic, sort of appealed to me. And then from behind me, a voice said, hey, what's your name? And that was at the time the freshman coach at Brown University. And he said, hey, would you be interested in rowing in the United States? I'm the Brown University coach. And I said, Brown, but Brown's a color. And, and from then on, there was communication. I ended up being at Brown, rowing at Brown for two years. <clears throat> Not four, but two. But I'll get to that in a second. So as you're cruising along, the most important part is make sure you're breathing, okay? Exhaling and spending more time exhaling than inhaling. And make sure that whoever came on, you have to stop your microphone. Make sure you're muting your microphone and extending those arms, stretching it out. That's it. Exhaling and stretching out. Very good. So, what I learned about rowing in, in, at university was something I couldn't have learned rowing in France. Because in France, where I started to row, it was me and maybe three other people. But once at the University of Brown, we were 50 people. A brick and mortar building. An institution of rowing. Whoa, all I can say is, I stepped into a machine. And go ahead and just grab a drink of water. I'll just make sure that everybody's mic is, is off. Uh, 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 whose mic is on? All uh, right, Jürgen, haha, <laughs> hello, Jürgen. So, Jürgen, I'm gonna turn off your mic. Jürgen, long history, he and I. All right, very good. Grab a drink. You know, rowing is a whole bunch of people is a different s situation. You know, in France, my enemy was everyone. <laughs> Anyone, you heard me right. In France, my enemy that I had to compete against was everyone, right? By myself. <laughs> when I showed up at Brown, I had people with a common enemy. <laughs> and that was, that was unbelievable. There were 50 people saying, okay, on this day, we have to beat so-and-so and so. That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. The amount of synergy that comes from a large team wanting to take down another team is just really, really one of the coolest thing ever. So I had my sights out for Harvard. Why? They were number one, best known, and just take him down. And we took him down. 
I will I will do a, I will film a, film a more detailed account of that. But that was amazing. And one of the things that I learned from there that I'm going to bring up in this row here is finding your groove. Find your trance. Find your rhythm. And the coach who was really good about that was a world champion himself and he was our freshman coach. His name is Scott Roop, an artist. And when he he trained with a fellow called Eric Hayden. Eric Hayden is a speed skater. And those two would run up ski lift slopes. But what Scott Roop really knew was that it took miles and miles and miles of steady rowing to build your stamina and not hard rowing, you know, sustained, continuous, and on and on and on. Something that I knew from being lactate tested when I was in Switzerland, so I had that knowledge. But it's a whole different ball game when you have two eights across the water rowing endlessly <laughs> for two and a half hours before having to rush to the dining hall and eat. So what I learned for rowing in the single skull at Brown is to treat the single skull like an eight. Once I was through with Brown, once Brown built me up, it was just more than myself in a single skull. Never did I feel alone in the single skull. I found my groove and said to myself, you are sitting in that single the same way you sat in that eight. And you just go when they say go and you don't stop until you hear the horn of the finish line. And it was amazing. I rode that single skull with the aggression of how people row an eight. And when you watch the finals in Atlanta, every once in a while, you see the stroke rate that I had, which was three to four beats higher than everybody else. And that was because in the eights, we rate higher. And that was awesome. So let's cruise along here, chest out, shoulders down, elbows fully extended. And we're moving through the water, gliding along, exhaling, and pushing through. I'm closing in on, right now I'm crossing 4,000 meters, extending those arms, stretching it out, pushing through. So my, my coming here to California is the result of the New England bad weather and I realized that if I needed to train somewhere, I needed to have good weather. <laughs> and so I asked, I asked the boat builder, my friend who was building my boat, the only white boat in that final at the Olympics and in 2000 and at the 1992 Olympics, he said, Zeno, do not go to Florida, go to California. And he had a picture, a poster, an aerial picture of the Newport Beach Harbor. And he said, look, you can row around these islands 
and way, way back there is Disneyland. And I said, okay, I will go. He himself rode into Newport Beach Harbor to get ready for his own Olympics in 1988 when the Olympics were held in Seoul, Korea. That's why he knew the place. And that's where he fell in love with Harley Davidson's motorcycles that he cannot ride in Switzerland because of noise ordinances. And that's a good thing. Now, if you like noise, Switzerland might not be the right place. <laughs> no loud motorcycles in Switzerland. Extending those arms, stretching it out, pushing it through. I'm at the 159, 158, stroke rate 22. In about five minutes, we'll do a drink, drink break, and pushing it and driving it. I showed up here in California on November 20th, 1995. What I loved immediately was the winter in California. I loved riding my bike on the bike path between Newport Beach and Seal Beach with the Pacific Ocean to my side. That was amazing. And I rode and I knew that my freedom to be training anywhere I ever wanted was going to hinge on how I will do at, the, at these Olympics, Atlanta Olympics. Because as a rower, you're not free. You're not financially free. It is extraordinary that I was someone who would not train with his own, own Olympic team. It was a foreign concept for me. So I grew up in France, then went to the US. So being part of a team was never something that I equated as being normal. So I would train by myself. My coach would show up every five weeks for 10 days from Switzerland. He was a Swiss national team coach. And he's the one who introduced me to bike riding or cycling. Trust me, I was never on the main road. Too dangerous. Drive it through, push on those legs, hang off your fingertips, and pushing and swinging. So, as I'm 49, I've now been married for 25 years. So if you make the math, that's April of 1996. <laughs> Aaron and I met in April of 1996 and we got married September of 1996. <laughs> when we met, I asked her, hey, look, yeah, I'm doing the Olympics. Would you would you come? Um, would you want to come and watch? And she said, "Of course." Uh, but for me, see, rowing at the Olympics was that was that was the normal path, right? I didn't realize that you know meeting Olympians or being around people who win a gold medal is really a rare occurrence. But when you live in that world, it's, it happens more often, right? But she was willing to come out. Of course, maybe some of you say, well, I would too. But you know, I mean, we had only met so many hours. And she met my mom, my sister, and decided, all right, that's not too bad <laughs> to meet my mom. And that's when we got married. 
So when my boat builder told me, hey, go row where I have the aerial picture on that poster, I didn't think that, heck, I might even get married there. Right? I mean, all these things that one doesn't know is amazing. So she and I have now been married 25 years. We've got four children. They're all very passionate about their own own passion. And I'm very lucky. As we are rowing here, let's row another 20 seconds before we grab a drink and push it through and drive it. 10 more seconds. I'm closing in on 5,900 meters. All right, let's grab a drink. Very good. Very good. Cheers. Cheers. Go back to arms only, sitting up nice and tall, chest out. Belly button to the spine, shoulders are low, arms get to be fully extended. Adding in the swing of the upper body in one. On this one. That's right. It's good to uh, recalibrate the rowing stroke when you row far. Slows down the brain a little bit. Add in quarter slide in one. And here we go, quarter slide rowing. Let's go to half slide in one. On this one, half slide. Push it through. And we go to three quarter slide in one. On this one, compress the legs without lifting the heels. That's right, that's beautiful. Very nice. And we go to full slide in one, on this one, full slide. I have a personal narration of my race in 1996 that I will add to the notes of the workout. So I commented my own race and explain a little bit what was going on through my head. So I'll put the link in the notes. Extend those arms, stretch it out. See, my dad passed away at age uh, 50 minus three days. So this year is a very special year for me, where all of a sudden I realize that I'm going to outlive my dad and see the world like he never saw it. And when I, when I raced and won in Atlanta, my first my first gesture was a hand kiss to the sky to my dad, and uh, to the sky because you know again I'm not particularly religious, but if there's somewhere I'd like to think that my dad is, it's up in space or the sky, and so. So it was amazing. It was amazing to be able to win when four years earlier he was battling to stay alive. So that meant that was a heavy, heavy load of mental energy to wrangle with. But you know, as rowing helps you find your rhythm, find your groove. Find your breathing pattern. Rowing is very therapeutic. And 
And as you cruise along and you listen to my words, you get lost in your own rhythm, hanging off those fingertips, driving the legs, feel the stretch of your spine as you push the hip away from your feet and leave the handle as far away from you as possible during the drive and get the handle as far away from you as possible before the rise of the knees. That's really beautiful here. That's it, drive it. Now if you, if you know there were no children, <laughs> a whole new world started happening when Georgia and Zeno were born. All of a sudden, you see the world through other people's eyes that you have to take care of, make sure they don't kill themselves and they don't get into an accident. And this is how the second Olympics happened. We went to Sydney as a family. These Tokyo Olympics, I feel really bad for families that couldn't go in person, but it was necessary. In Sydney, most athletes would not travel with their family. But luckily my coach, who knew me well, said, Zeno needs to travel with his family because he, if he doesn't, he doesn't function, function normally. And so me, Aaron, Georgia, Zeno, and my mom-in-law, Mimi, we traveled to Brisbane at first, spent three weeks acclimating to the beautiful, beautiful uh, Australian spring, and I was getting ready to go to my third Olympics. And you know, the beauty is, when you do something for the third time, you know it. And that was an amazing feeling to be able to be there with the family and I did a personal narration of that race as well and I will put that in the notes of the workout as well had been a second gold medal I won't spoil it though it was a silver but what I'm not spoiling is my thought process afterwards. It's amazing how lucky I was to be racing the way I raced in Sydney. When we returned, I really started shifting my thinking as to what am I going to do with my life? And that moment is the reason why we are rowing together. That was it. I was the first one on the block to decide, hey, let's bring rowing to everyone else who does not know what a rowing stroke is. And we started the indoor rowing studio called the Iron Oarsman here in Costa Mesa and off I took. I cut a second loan, second line of credit out of my house, bought a bunch of rowing machines and I hoped it was going to work. And you know it did, but only as many rowing machines as I could fit in a room. Tom was rowing with us. He was part of that. He was part. Yeah, he was part of that iron oarsman, and it was great. The only thing I realized is, hey, there's only one of me, 
and there are only 12 or 13 rowing machines that we can fill. And there came a moment where people wouldn't tell others anymore to show up because they did not want to miss out on having a seat on the rowing machine. <laughs> so then I started thinking, oh crap, the family is growing, so is the family budget. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know, YouTube started growing at that time. I always thought, hey, let's just broadcast. Can we not broadcast my workouts to people's computers? And it was at its infancy, YouTube or live streaming. It was just not happening. Not yet. And look, I then switched to coaching individuals online, which was totally ahead of its time considering the type of industry rowing is. But look at us now. I mean, look at us now. Here we are cruising along. We have rowers in Germany, the Netherlands, and in the United States. Cruising, breaking a sweat, hopefully smiling from one ear to the other. And learning the rowing stroke that Harry Mann from New Zealand taught me, taught his 1972 Olympic gold medalists from New Zealand. And the 2000 Olympic gold medalists in the Great Britain 8, I might as well put that race into the notes as well because the more you listen to me rowing, explaining the rowing stroke, you will start noticing that technique, that minimal drive of the upper body during the leg drive, shoulders low, fluid hands away. Ah, it's beautiful. As I tell you the story, I smile inside and on my face because it helps me remember those many, many afternoons that I rode on the River Seine in the town of Fontainebleau in France. The Seine was a little bit green of water, it was current, and I would row and find that groove and know that I was given good instruction about technique. My parents were happy that I was burning off energy because if I weren't burning off the energy, I would be bouncing off the wall at home in France. But they knew that all this energy was being expended and brought home a son <laughs> who, before he left for, for the practice, was at 17 or 18 on a scale of 10. <laughs> so when I came home, I was probably a seven or an eight <laughs> and drive it and extend feel that flow and you know let's bring it back to oh, I'm at 9,000 meters we're at 39 minutes um, so let's bring it back to this year okay a year ago on August 20th 2020 I decided to start the program called DDP Yoga. And I tell you, credit is due where credit is due. And shout out to Diamond Dallas Page. You may never see this ever, Diamond Dallas Page. 
but I will remind you if one day we meet in person. He, he brought me back to a, a self, sense of self, where I realized, my goodness, Zeno, you're good at this. Do it, get a body that works for you. And I loved following his lead on the workouts that he had that taught me how to be more flexible, better core and everything. So that was in August of 2020. In November of 2020, I thought, bloody hell, I really liked, I really liked running workouts. And this is where we are. So in, in November of 2020, that was it. I said, come on, Zeno. I loved running workouts. The mouth doesn't know how to be quiet. The body doesn't know how to stop rowing. Let's put this to work. Build, build a team, synergy, taking care of yourself so we can take care of others. Make us positive with energy, stronger, lead by example. The world needs us. If you think like I think, we're able to make the world more positive. And bloody heck, it sounds like a cold, but that's not my goal, right? We want to row and stay strong. We want to be strong until we blow up, okay? And I believe that's doable. And I think we will only blow up when we are 300 years young. And blowing up is good. You know, I think back on my poor dad. So, that life force that we have as we cruise along here, finding our rhythm, extending those arms, reaching across our toes before the rise of the knees, stretching our shoulder blades out before the rise of our knees holding the handle in our fingertips, pushing down the knees away from our chest before we swing the back open. On my 49th birthday, I thank my lucky stars every single day. Every night I go to bed, I thank my wife for helping me <clears throat> find what's really important. You know, being appreciative of the small things, having a positive personal narration, looking at the glass half full, seeing the silver lining, reminding yourself what's important. Focusing on your own personal goals that not just benefit you, but benefit the people you love. Every single day, finding that rhythm, staying positive, pushing off your most powerful muscles, finishing the stroke strongly to the sternum, very close to your heart. Bring your handle to your heart. I've never said that before in my life. You row with heart, bring that handle to your heart. That's right. Hang, feel the stretch, finish the stroke, and drive it through. I will push another 500 meters here. The row will have totaled 
11,000 meters on my mark. Extend those arms. You guys are my, you're a team, you're my team. And every rower brings energy. When my screen populates with everyone who's rowing, you bring me energy, every single one of you. And if I can return it the way we think we are, I love it. This is the reason why I don't see this ever ha stopping. This is part of my life and I want everyone who chooses to row feel that same way, whether they row with me or with others. We can help, we can be helpful. We can give and share our energy. Let's go to three quarter slide. Sitting tall, chest out. I look over my shoulder and there's the boathouse. It was a beautiful, beautiful day to be rowing on glassy body of water, cutting through the water, leaving the puddles behind you. And the farther you row, the more those earlier strokes fade away, those puddles fade away. When you row in colder climates, you can see the steam come off your arms and your face and your mouth. And you know that every breath you take is a cleansing breath. Let's go to half slide in one. On this one, half slide. <sighs> Sitting tall, chest out, take your time. <sighs> very, very nice. Let's go to upper body and arms only. Beautiful. I have energy and I'm not gonna stop until I'm 300 years young. Let's go to arms only, chest out. And I've got 11,100 meters. I grab a drink. This was a great workout. I love it. I'm very happy I was able to share some of my memories in this workout. And keep rowing. Be good to yourself. Make yourself stronger so you can be there for your loved ones. Make the world a better place. Row every second day and every other day you can do DDP yoga or any other cross training exercise you want to do, of course. Keep the body moving. Use it or lose it. Let's row until we are 300 years young. All right, you guys. Wonderful. Wonderful. I salute my mom, who's not with us anymore. But thank you, mom, for raising me the way you raised me. <laughs> oh, she was a volcano. All right. Take good care of your loved ones, everyone. Whether your loved one is a human or a pet or whatever you care about, take care of it. Share your love and passion with others because, because that's what's really so true about life. You know, it's funny. I never thought about stuff like that when I was 20. <laughs> but now, now you start thinking about it. All right, you guys, have a great week, and I'll see you on Saturday. Bye! Bye-bye!